I'm just waiting to make sure this uploads before I start talking in too much detail. There we go. Hello, everyone. Welcome as you come in. I know this is uh, kind of a strange time, but I like to do something before. Shalom, lovely, 11144. I like to do something. Thanks for letting me know it's 5x5. Five five. I like to do something before the weekend, usually. You know, Friday, either afternoon or evening, I'll sometimes put up a video about something that I think is important. Whether or not anybody else does, that's that's another question altogether. But I thought that this one would be important for today. For those of you who are worried about spiritual things, we're going to touch a little on that and on the political situation as well. It'll get, be kind of a little bit of both. Let me tell you where I'm coming from and... I'm going to give you some information today that most people don't know about as far as as this. Uh, and I've alluded to a lot of this in the past, and I've caused a lot of controversy, uh, probably a lot of consternation, uh, hopefully some heart searching, some uh, core checking, checking your inner core, what you really are. And that's really part of my motivation because we have so much external that takes time away from us searching our own souls, our own, our own minds, our own hearts, and finding out where those connections take us. Because out here, there's a war going on, just like there is inside us. But out here, uh, there's, of course, just so much going on that's so evil. So, again, those of you who don't like to have spiritual discussions, you might not be interested in this, but I'd advise you to just kind of pay attention anyway, if you would. So I've been on Twitter today, and I've been having a discussion. If uh, any of you know who Stephen Coughlin is and Gigi Sims uh, on Twitter, if you don't have Twitter, I'd suggest, even though it's a kind of a problem, get it because you a few people that you follow like those two are really, really good. And there are some others. Uh, Roosevelt, of course, does a lot of good work uh, and, and others. Okay. But my point is, is I was, I was on there today and we were talking about this situation, the Department of Defense and how we've been subverted from inside, even in our own Department of Defense that was supposed to be there to protect us against these threats uh, from from afar and close, and how inside the Department of Defense in particular, it's been taken over uh, over many years, actually, probably decades, by these individuals who get into positions of power and have destroyed our ability to recognize real threats, including the one that's taken us over now, which is basically... Uh, unconstrained, unrestrained warfare, which Stephen Coughlin talked about uh, back several, well, about 20 years ago, which got him basically removed from uh, the Army, from the Department of Defense, I guess, at that time, because he was trying to point out these dangers and how they were creeping in to our establishments, our institutions. And Gigi, uh, Gigi Sims was nice enough to remind me of that today. But anyway, we got to discussing some of the reasons why all this has happened and whether or not it was done consciously or subconsciously. And of course, I think it was both, uh, especially in the upper brass, primarily consciously as a takeover, because even as Millie said, China's not our enemy. You know, they're an up and coming uh, world power and we need to respect them, you know, all this kind of nonsense. Not to mention the, uh, the Marxist takeover with the mass line movements and the subversion of our uh, educational, religious, and corporate institutions and government institutions, all of that, it's really been a full-spectrum dominance a, attack on us. So we were talking about that, and I told Gigi, I said, you know, you may have noticed that I've changed a little bit. I mean, I've always talked about spiritual things. I've had my, my religion series and my Eisenman series, and off and on I'll bring up things, both biblical, non-biblical, uh, 
uh, esoteric, you know, different things like this. Hi, Liza Jean. And uh, thanks for being here. Um, so, oh, by the way, if Lion Lady shows up, you can throw her off without waiting. I've, I've tried to hide her from the channel. Uh, gave me a lot of trouble the other day. But at any rate, so I... I I, I told Gigi, I said, you know, you probably noticed this change where I'm doing a lot more on the biblical things, on, on religious history, uh, those types of things like that. And I said, the reason why is because we are focused out here so much, but we really can't do much to change that. We certainly have to try. But there's an old saying, and the old saying is, be the change that you want to see in the world, right? So with that realization and that we have lost so much of our real spiritual core i have purposely decided to cover those spiritual subjects more often and i know it affects a lot of people especially when it seems that i'm attacking your particular religious preferences or your belief system i'm not really doing that if it seems like that, it probably should tell you that maybe I'm hitting a chord in you that's saying that you need to check into that inner core that you have and, and work on it a little bit. And that's really why I'm doing this, to get people to look inside, even if I challenge what your long-held beliefs or even, you know, recent beliefs that you've, that you've put together, that you've formulated, whatever. Nothing is ever as it seems. And where we really make the mistake is when we sit and we become lackadaisical and we believe that we've arrived. And when that happens, that's when you're most susceptible to error. Well, I got a, a DM from Jeannie Rose. And I think if Jeannie's on here, she'll know what I'm talking about. So I was having this conversation with Gigi Sims and Stephen Coughlin, and then I got this, this message from Jeannie. And she brought up something because she had read, remember the other day I put up some information on the Dead Sea Scrolls, and I especially wanted you to read the Thanksgiving hymns that I'm explaining to you were, were written by Jesus himself, the person that you know is Jesus. That, and scholars will ask me, well, how do you know that, Roy? Well, <laughs> you know, uh, the timing, the subject matter, uh, what they tried to hide from uh, when, they, when the Dead Sea Scrolls came out, the, all this information they've been trying to hide, why, you know, doing the reverse engineering as to what they were trying to hide to protect their institutions and those types of things. But the subject matter and the way that it grabs you when you read it and some other things, like I told you that I, I had an old sage that had some ancient or some old, old writings and it explained that that's where that came from. Uh, and I won't get into that in any other detail, but I just wanted you to go read that so you could feel it, the hymns, the Thanksgiving hymns. And it's kind of long, I know, but it was it's very good. And it's in the description box of, of, the, of the video that I did the other day. Uh, I guess it was yesterday morning. So at any rate, Jeannie Rose read those and then came back and said to me, Wow. It sounds like he was having much of the same kind of troubles we're having today. And I said, yeah, that's the point. Hi, Ms. Cat, how you doing? And uh, then, she, then she sent me something, which I had read many years ago. It was part of my study, my historical study, and, and, and study into religious systems and all that. But she sent something to me I'd actually forgotten about, and it's the Elephantine papyri, which were found in Egypt. Uh, and I'm not going to give you the whole history, but it was a group of Jews around uh, 600 BC that had left uh, Judea in that area and had settled in Elephantine, Egypt, which was basically a, a Jewish outpost, is what it was, a Jewish fort. And they built a temple there. And I've talked about the temple also in On in Heliopolis, which uh, the last high priest known to history, Ananias, built. Uh, as a result of the Seleucids coming into Judea, and that was in the, about the 2nd uh, century B.C., 2nd to 1st century B.C. But there was this one in Elephantine as well, this Jewish settlement. 
and it was discovered and they found these elephantine papyri and they noticed something. These are Jews, but they're not doing things according to Torah. Uh, as a matter of fact, they're almost polytheistic. And there's some other things about the elephantine papyra that were very important as far as historical information about what was going on with the Jewish people at that particular time. Now, those who study the Bible know that the Jews, both the, the northern kingdoms and the southern kingdom of Judea, uh, they dabbled in, uh, in pagan religions from time to time. Solomon certainly did. And, and we saw that also happening under like uh, King Manasseh and, and people like that. So they fought with this back and forth all the time within their, their group. But, but Israel was not the, the cohesive, historically, was not the cohesive unit that most people think that it was when they read the Bible. And that's why I say you've got to be very careful about believing that the Bible is the infallible Word of God. If you don't know the history, if you don't know the culture, if you don't know what was going on then, and you rely on it without relying on the Spirit speaking to you, and I know there's some danger in that, but that's really where the battle is, is in you anyway. Not even in this. And I'm going to tell you why. And I just mentioned this elephantine papyri because the point is, is that the Israelites were not unified or homogenous in any way, shape, or form. In fact, the Torah wasn't really put together until the time of Ezra. If you notice in the book, in the in the Old Testament, at least in the King James version, Ezra and Nehemiah come even before Isaiah. Well. Ezra and Nehemiah weren't around until Jeremiah's time, right around the, 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 the Babylonian captivity. Well, Ezra was a high priest, and that's probably not his real name, uh, and it may have, in fact, been Jeremiah himself. The scholars aren't sure about that, but the fact of the matter is, is that the Torah didn't really exist as such. The Old Testament, the Pentateuch, the five books of the Bible, didn't really exist as such until the time of Ezra. He was the great redactor. Well, you say, well, what does that then do to, to the efficacy of the Scriptures? Well, that's the point. What was really going on there? How many political decisions were made in putting the Torah together? Now, I've said, of course, you've heard me talk about the fact that Jesus in particular and James felt very strongly about the Torah, but that was almost more of a cultural thing. And I'm not going to get into the real detailed points of that because it would take me a lecture to give it to you, a very long one. We'd have to do it over several, several hour long discussions, but I'm kind of, I'm kind of putting it all together very quickly here. So Ezra put together all of these different not homogenous, but, but very different viewpoints in the Israelite religious history, both polytheistic, monotheistic, and one of the most important things, and you can look this up if you'd like, Ezra had to take two different viewpoints of God and the, and the creation story and God's dealing, dealings with people, and they were called the Yahwist and the Eloist points of view. The Yahweh, of course, believed in the God Yahweh who was over the land because in those days, gods were attached to the land. That's how they talked about it. And you can see that, uh, for instance, with uh, uh, Pharaoh, Necho, when he was dealing with Josiah, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. And, of course, with Nebuchadnezzar and that whole thing where they, and, and even Cyrus uh, of Persia, who talked about the God Yahweh being the God of the land where the, where the Israelites were living there were different gods were attached to different parts of the land okay and and so there was that group the yahwists and then there were the eloists and those are the ones that where you see a lot, uh, talking a lot about the elohim etc and today not knowing this history we get all upset about whether god was elohim or or yahweh elohim or <clears throat> I had this one lady tell me, well, you know, it starts out with God, and then it talks about the Lord God. Well, the Lord God must be a bad guy because, you know, things change. No, it was because Ezra was redacting the two different points of view. He had a political reason for writing the Torah, especially Genesis, the way he did. He was trying to placate two separate factions 
in Judah at the time. See, I'm giving you a history lesson, but I'm trying to point out to you that many things that you think are scriptural right from God's mouth, a lot of it had to do with political concerns, and this is an example. Another, which I see talking about all the time, as a matter of fact, on this elephantine papyra, the, the, the scholars who discovered that and talked about it were saying, well, they really shouldn't have built a temple in Elephantine because that's forbidden by the, by the, by the scriptural law. Well, where's that? Well, where that came from, of course, was the whole thing with David when he moved the tabernacle from Shiloh to Jerusalem. Well, who came up with that idea? Was it really God or was it David just trying to solidify his political power? Well, historically, it's to solidify his political power, and he just used God as the excuse for doing it. That'll cause a lot of consternation, too, but historically, that's what happened. And this whole thing with Elephantine, uh, as Jeannie was kind enough to send me, reminded me that to bring these things up to all these people who are so concerned about, about finding fault in somebody because they don't believe in this the way they think everybody should. You know, they, they get upset when people don't think about it the way they should, or especially when it comes to Jesus, that if you don't accept Jesus, you're going to hell. And some of the most horrible people in the, in the world are Christians who, who immediately judge others and forget that Jesus said, you better be careful how you judge others because by the judgment you mete out will be meted to you. Well, they conveniently forget that because they want to be, they want to be judgmental. They want to be right so bad that they're willing to, to, to condemn others in the process. Well, I've given you this background information because I'm going to bring up a particular point. Again, I talk about these things because we can talk about what's happening with the disease. We can talk about the situation with Russia, with China, with the takeover of our government by, by communist Marxists, by, by what's happening in our schools, our institutions, drag queen story time, uh, uh, you know, everything that's going on that's horrible. And it is. But why is that happening? Well, the people that control this are partly responsible. That's why I talk about the person you know is Jesus and then his brother James, that to them, even though the Torah was very important to them, above and beyond all else, it was the two great commandments. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, mind, and strength, and love thy neighbor as, as thyself. Upon these two rest all the law and the prophets. James called it the perfect law of liberty or the royal law, and, and Jesus basically just said those two things, and most of you know that, right? All the rest is commentary according to, to, to the rabbis. And I'm talking about in the first century B.C. and the first century A.D. So what does all this mean? What does all this mean? Well, I'm going to read something to you out of 2 Kings. Okay? And if anybody wants to follow along, go to 2 Kings chapter 22. I'm going to show you right in the Old Testament that they didn't have all the Torah. And if they did, they weren't, they weren't abiding by it too well. But they actually didn't have all of it. And it's right here. Let me read this to you. 2 Kings 22. Now, King Josiah took the throne at eight years old, they figure. Eight years later, this happens. I want to read this to you. This is, again, 2 Kings chapter 22, starting at verse 3. And it came to pass in the 18th year of King Josiah that the king sent Shaphan and the son of Azaliah, Az, sorry, Azaliah, the son of Meshulam, the scribe to the house of the Lord, saying, listen to this, go up to Hilkiah the high priest. Now, Hilkiah is the father of Jeremiah, just so you know. Go up to Hilkiah the high priest, that he may sum the silver which is brought into the house of the Lord, which the keepers of the door have gathered of the people. And let them deliver it into the hand of the doers of the work that have the oversight of the house of the Lord. And let them give to the doers of the work which is in the house of the Lord to repair the breaches of the house. It's to repair the temple. Now listen. I'm going to skip down a little bit. 
Well, let's just keep reading there. Verse 7. Howbeit there was no reckoning made with them of the money that was delivered into their hand because they dealt faithfully. Now verse 8. And Hilkiah, listen to this, listen. And Hilkiah the high priest said unto Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan and he read it. And Shaphan the scribe came to the king and brought the king word again and said, Thy servants have gathered the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of them that do the work that have the oversight of the house of the Lord. And Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest hath delivered me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. And it came to pass when the king had heard the words of the book of the law that he rent his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah the priest and Aniakim the son of Shaphan and Abkor the son of Milkiah and Shaphan the scribe and and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Go ye and inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and for the Judah concerning the words of this book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us because our fathers have not hearkened to the words of this book. Was it the whole book of the Torah? Probably not. It was probably the book of Deuteronomy or a part of it. And this is called the, the discovery of the Deuteronomic law. So, where did all this come from? It came from Ezra, almost 100 years later. I don't bring these things up to you to attack your faith or to, again, I, I do want to cause some disturbance in you because we rest on what we're told. We don't find out for ourselves. And then we wonder why the world is in such a mess. How did our politicians turn on us and, and become enemies to us, the people? How did that happen? What was it that occurred? How did our, how did our institutions, our religious institutions, become the way they have? How did that happen? What is it that occurred here? It's because we're not doing the work ourselves. And that's been a real problem, really a big problem. I've got a black... <laughs> this is funny. I'm not far from the NSA, and I've got a, a black uh, uh, Chevy Suburban checking me out. <laughs> Jesus. These guys, I tell you what. Anyway, so to continue. So they keep us so focused on what they're doing and we get all of that wickedness and evil churning in us. So what I'm trying to do is trying to show you that we need to get back to our core. I'm not even saying your belief in your religious system is wrong. I'm not saying it's right. I'm saying you have to have the courage to search and, and search it out and to, to test it every day, to challenge it. To, and in the process of doing that, you're not focusing so much out here. You're focusing on the inside, which is where the change really needs to happen. That's what God's really interested in. He could get, he's going to destroy all these other systems. He wants you to have his law discovered and abided in your heart and in your mind. God has cursed Roy in this channel. <laughs> Who said that? Grace. Well, thank you for caught. I don't know. Grace is usually not that bad. I don't know. I guess these people sit on here until, you know, their, their time to, to, to be called into action occurs. What do they call those? Uh, um, I forgot the title right now, what those are. Uh, sleeper agents. <laughs> yeah, this, this Suburban's parked just right over here. I'll show it to you so you know I'm not kidding you. Well, maybe you can see it. It's right there. See it? That's it. <laughs> I just pulled up, and he's sitting there watching me. There are two of them inside. Yeah, it really happens. It really does. Okay. So what I'm saying is, 
even Ezra, even, even Josiah, who, by the way, he destroyed all of the high altars uh, like his, his great-grandfather Hezekiah did. Destroyed all the pagan altars, actually the high altars that the Israelites had been worshiping, which may have been a problem. And then God promises him he'll die a peaceful death. He, God promised Josiah that he would die a peaceful death. Well, guess how he died? He decided to stand up against the, the, the Pharaoh of Egypt, Necho, in support of the Babylonians, or the Assyrians, one of the two. Anyway, the point is, he didn't die a peaceful death, even after he destroyed all these altars to the false gods, right? Necho killed him. The Pharaoh Necho killed Josiah, who had been promised by God that he'd only see death in a peaceful manner. Uh-oh, uh-oh. There are all kinds of reasons that people express as to why. So you have Ezra redacting the Old Testament from two different sources, two different points of view politically to come up with the Torah we have now. You have the situation there in Kings where we find out that, that Hilkiah, the priest, finds the, the book of the law. Well, didn't they have it before? And what was it exactly? And like I said, it was most likely, if not all of Deuteronomy, a part of Deuteronomy, and, and they called it the Deuteronomic law. And then we have all of these other things going on. I've shown you the, the Dead Sea Scrolls and how they don't jive with what we have in the New Testament. I mean, there are, there are correspondences. It's not all totally opposite, but there's enough that you should ask yourself why. And it's because of these people out here and the people that control this, the Council of Nicaea, the Council of Yavna. The machinations of Rome, which still exist today. So what do you have to do? The two laws. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, mind, and strength. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Upon these two stand all the law of the prophets. That's where you need to be. You need to take the law of God and, and allow him to put it in your heart and in your mind. And yes, you're not going to get all the answers at front. But it's the searching. It's the journey of searching that's important. Because otherwise, you get lazy. You get believing that you've got it all figured out. And as I've put it many, many times, I don't need to, you know, people don't, don't want to get, they want to say that they're right. They don't want to get right. So it's not an attack on you. I'm trying to get you to really question everything. And is that a lack of faith? Well, no, because God said, let us reason together as one man reasons with another. And if you have something that's based on a false premise, let's find it. Let's figure it out. Let's, let's address it. Don't hide it. Because then what happens is, is evil takes over, just like they have in our world today. So that's all I've got for you Friday afternoon. I'm going to be meeting some friends here shortly, and we're going to take some time and uh, do some things. I want to thank everybody for coming um, we're in dire straits, and I don't know if God's really going to help us out or not. I mean, you know, we've got Revelation that talks about the dividing and all that. Um, the dividing's definitely happening. And as I've said before, we need to embrace that division because the wheat and the tares, that has to be done. The thing is, is we have to be able to survive all this, and so you need to open up and you need to not just see what's happening in the world, but get yourself centered in your core. And if you've got errors in there, get them out. And the only way you're going to do that is by asking God to help you. And he's not just going to download like in a revelation, like in you know, thunder and lightning. You know, he's going to lead you to things that you can look at because he wants you to discover it on your own with a little help from him. Because that shows that you're putting in the effort. Again, go back and read the the. the in the video before this one, the live stream I did on the Thanksgiving hymns. 
and read that and look at how, I'll just say it this way, how the author of that is struggling within himself. He didn't know all the answers. He wasn't born knowing everything from the start to the beginning, <laughs> from the start of the from the start to the end. It was a struggle even for him. And it's a beautiful, beautiful struggle. And then you'll see how he desires the very best, not just for himself, where he asks God to, 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 to take out of him the rough spots, I'll put it that way, so that he can be with, with God in the eternal realms. But he also says the same thing for you. That's all I've got. I've got to go meet my friends, but I wanted to get that out to you today. Go look at 2 Kings chapter 22. See what happens there. Go read Ezra. Ezra won't give you a whole lot of information, but we know historically that he redacted the old the, the Torah. He redacted the Torah. Took the two opposing viewpoints and made a, a book, five books, that both, both sides of the argument could live with. That's how it happened. The New Testament, as I've said, very suspicious, especially the Pauline letters. Got to be careful of that. But that's up to you. I just pointed out to you because there are difficulties there, extreme difficulties. Not saying it's all bad. But it certainly isn't all good. And think about this as I've brought it up many, many times. We see this division between men and women today. We see the idea of androgyny. We see the, the idea of transgenderism. And we even know that the elites are trying to push for sexless humans. Why? Unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, it's in your New Testament. Jesus is attributed to pushing that, along with the Gnostic stuff that was later. I could get into the Gnostics and Elaine Pagels and all of that with the, with the study of the Gnostic scriptures that were found in Nag Hammadi, but all of that is Greek thought. It's not Hebraic. So there's no way in the world Jesus said that. The seven, seven brothers with the woman, where he, where he said that, there, that in, the, in, the, in heaven there's neither male nor female, and that and that uh, there's no marriage there because they're like the angels in heaven in the resurrection. That goes er against everything that's in Genesis 1 and 2. You might say, well, but Adam, well, you know, Eve was taken out of Adam. Well, I've already explained in a previous video what that was and what the rib really was. It wasn't, it wasn't an androgynous being that was split into a man and a woman. That's really not what happened. That's the way the story's told so that it's kind of like talking to children. A rib just means by the side. He, he, she was by his side. And, I, and as I've explained before, and I'm not going to get into that here, it's not, it's not really what it appears to be. But the point is, a lot of what they're doing right now and the, if you read 1984 and Brave New World and those things where it talks about, you know, that, that uh, having romance is unlawful, that the state decides those things, right? If, the, if you get it at all. That's based on those statements by Jesus. And you've been fooled about things like that for many, many years. And because of it, a lot of people go along with it. And they hurt themselves and their 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 future as a result. That's all I got. Y'all take care out here for now. Have a nice weekend. I might see you again. I'm not sure. Take care. Bye.